Julian, I've always been fascinated with time, and you've famously written about the end of time. So what is time? Let's start with what time is as we experience it ourselves personally, okay. subjectively. My impression of time is that I see a succession of pictures, as it were, a succession of snapshots con changing continuously one into another. I'm looking at you, you're right. nodding your head in right. agreement. Right. So that's the starting point. Now, I think this shows that without that change, we wouldn't have any notion of time, without those differences. And certainly, uh, if one had a, 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 just a record, showing uh, just one completely unchanging picture, you couldn't tell whether time had passed or whether nothing had happened at all. Certainly. Uh, so that's, that's the starting point. Now, interestingly, Isaac Newton insisted that even if absolutely nothing at all happened, time would be passing. And that, I believe, is completely wrong because we really need evidence for things. We, that, that wouldn't pass muster in a law of court. So. We have to have something that is changing so that we can confirm claims that are made. And bit by bit, scientific notions of time have built up. And people learn, first of all, that the rotation of the stars across the sky, first of all the sun, but then they realized that the stars was a, were a more accurate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. measure of time. And, and for two and a half millennia, it was the motion of the stars across the sky, and you said it's midday when the sun is due south. Now that shows again that positions of objects are more fundamental than the passage of time, because you needed to know when the sun was due south to say it's midday now. Certainly defining time. Defining time, yes. But even being aware that there is something called time, you need to have that change. Uh, if one just took photographs, as I say, and there's nothing changed in, in the photograph, you can't say whether time has passed. C correct, but it may be that time has passed, and you just can't say. Well, I would only prefer to put a name on something that I can see. Okay. Uh, I, if I eat an apple, I want to have the taste of an apple, and I want to have the real taste of time. I don't want to have something non-existent. So that's my, my view on that. Now, as people studied things more, uh, bit by bit, notions of time, people started to measure time and to actually su uh, successfully make clocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the really major change came with Isaac Newton, who formulated laws of motion, which still work extraordinarily well to this day. And that explains actually why we're able to keep appointments because it does ultimately explain why watchmakers can make watches which march in step. Mm -hmm. But what is really happening, they're not marching in step with time, they're marching in step with each other. That's the key thing. Mm -hmm. And Newton's laws of motion, you can rewrite them so that there's no invisible river of time flowing away like that. All that they really establish is how the reading on my watch is related to the reading on your watch. And as long as that, those march in step, that's fine. That's all we need. That is really what timekeeping is about and what time is for practical purposes. And if anyone can tell me any more about time than that, at least at the level of, of, of our practical experience yes. and using even our very accurate watches, well, let me know. <laughs> okay, so, so you have two watches and they're both going through successive snapshots. And if the snapshots are coordinated, and uh, th then we each have a common sense of, of, of what time is. And if we didn't have that, they w we wouldn't have a sense of time. Yes, and this was the fantastic discovery that, that, that Newton made, mm -hmm. that he uh, utterly simple laws he was able to formulate, which capture that perfectly. He confused the issue, I believe, by saying that in addition to these correlations <laughs> uh -huh. between the watches, there is this mysterious invisible time. <laughs> but this is also very deep rooted in psychology. People have this impression that, and I do too. Everybody does, uh, sure. That time is, is going forward. It's, it's a very deep psychological experience. Okay, take it forward from Newton, then what? Then there were various, um, refinements on there. Einstein comes along. He, he then showed that the idea of absolute simultaneity, that there's the same now everywhere in the universe, 
is very difficult to maintain when you take into account things that are moving fast uh, at the sp uh, close to the speed of light. So this changed notions of time very much in, in relativity, but in fact when it comes down to what a clock is and why clocks can march in step, what Einstein did is really a relatively minor change to what uh, Newton did. Mm -hmm. And in fact, strangely, uh, Einstein paid a lot of attention to how you define simultaneity at spatially separated points. But I've looked carefully at his papers and his letters, and he never seems to have spent much time on thinking about how do you define duration? What does it mean to say that a second today is the same as a second mm. tomorrow? It's, it's quite a strange gap in his thinking. Mm. And I don't think he really did have a particularly good idea of what a clock actually is. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> okay, so what can we conclude? How do we, wh where does this leave us? As long as we stay within classical physics, I think that's about all we can, we can say. We don't need, this, this, the, there comes a point where we can't say any more at a certain stage. We've reached a plateau. And I, I think that um, one had reached a plateau until quantum mechanics was discovered. Now, quantum mechanics is in some ways very like Newtonian theory, but in other ways it's very, very different. Uh, and in quantum mechanics you have atoms which behave in an extraordinarily regular way. So instead of basing clocks on things like my quartz oscillator here in my wristwatch or the good old rotation of the stars across the sky, um, they then were able to use these atomic clocks which, by the way, are immensely complicated things. These clock, I've been having a debate with, with someone who's, who claims to have the second most accurate clock mm -hmm. in the world in his laboratory, and, and I'm challenging him to, uh, to say, what is exactly a clock? He says it's just one atom which is vibrating there. I say that's nonsense because you've left out the clock face. You, you can't read my watch. It's got to have the hands on the clock to read it. Mm -hmm. And that's just as true for an atomic clock. And the more accurate you want that clock to be so that it marches in step with other clocks better and better, you have to make more and more care that the clock face is exactly where it should be and the clock mm -hmm. face is not wandering around <laughs> all over the place. And whenever you want to make things more accurate, actually you have to take more and more care on a bigger environment. And in fact the way time is now told on the Earth with, with atomic clocks, there's, there's about 10 really key clocks and then about 400 that back it up. But then there's also a vast amount of information about the whole of the Earth, continental drift, the, the shape of the Earth, what the planets are doing, the moon. All of these things have to be taken into account to, to actually get the time signals which are used for bank transactions and things like that nowadays. So it's a huge business. It's, it's quite extraordinary where timekeeping has got to.